Cor ad Cor Locator, which means heart speaks to heart. And this is the personal relationship that can be achieved through man and God through and prayer. Father, as soon as I entered here, I was really struck by the design of this church. It's absolutely fascinating. And I'm guessing or I'm thinking that this was the thought of Newman. Yes, indeed. Well, the oratory is a series of communities of secular priests, so we're not religious. This is the room of St. John Henry Newman. It is indeed, and, and as I say, just one room. Oratorian fathers don't have suites of rooms. The reading of the church fathers in the 1830s and 40s, which brought young Newman to a realization that he had to join the Catholic Church. Welcome, my name is Neil McDonough, and if you've been following me along this pilgrimage, today I'm at a very special site. I am at the place that was founded by Britain's first modern saint. Yes, that's right, St. John Henry Newman. I am in Birmingham at the Birmingham Oratory, and this place is absolutely filled with articles from the life of St. John Henry Newman. Follow me as I'm about to explore. Well, great to meet you. Yeah, it's nice Thanks to meet so you. Thanks so much. Yes, yes. I'm really Welcome. looking forward to exploring. Yes, indeed. Yes, Ooh, yes. thank you. Yes, Ooh. here we go. So, Father Guy Nichols, thank you so much for your time. I'm really looking forward to exploring. But just before we do, would you mind sharing with me some of the history of the oratory? Well, the oratory is um, an institution. It's a series of communities of secular priests, so we're not religious in the sense of taking vows. And we go back uh, in history to the 16th century in Rome, and the original founder of the Roman oratory was St. Philip Neri. And so he formed this congregation of priests whose principal duty was to organize the devotions of the oratory for lay people. And the devotions of the oratory were ways in which St. Philip wanted to try and build up a sense of devotion to God um, in daily life uh, for the lay people and to bring them to a greater awareness of the love of God through the sacraments, through preaching, and also through such cultural enrichment as represented particularly by music and art, especially music. St. Philip was in many ways quite exceptional in his time as a priest in being aware of the, the extraordinary power of music. And that always from then onwards became associated with the 
with the ministry and, um, and style of the oratory. Okay. So every oratorian church generally has, has quite a strong artistic and, and musical element to it. So each oratory is independent? Yes, each one is, is, is entirely autonomous. Okay. Um, so each community is, is, is um, able to aggregate new members to itself. And so over the, obviously over the centuries, of course, it, it, the whole of the ministry uh, is, is passed on from each generation of fathers to the next. And so we are, if you like, here in Birmingham, we're the inheritors of the tradition that was set up by St. John Henry Newman. Okay, what year is this? So he founded the oratory here in England, here in Birmingham, in fact, in 1848. Um, it's the, the very first um, oratory uh, in, in England. So in many ways, it was quite a pioneering um, uh, effort on his part because he, as you know, was received into the Catholic Church in 1845. Mm. He went over to Rome to prepare for ordination as a Catholic priest. And while he was there, he was looking for ways in which he and some of his companions might give their talents particularly to the life of the church in this country, which of course was still in many ways quite um, a, a minority. It had for centuries up until about only 20 years prior to this been a per, more or less a persecuted minority. And of course, one also that had therefore not enjoyed all the usual advantages of education, of, of social intercourse and, and advancement through careers and such like. So it was quite a, a small and many ways impoverished body. Uh, and so Newman and his friends wanted to do what they could to bring about a greater enrichment of the, the lives and, and, and religious, especially the religious lives of the, 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 the Catholic people of this country. And he found in the idea of St. Philip and his way of engaging the, the Roman people of the 16th century, something which he saw could easily and profitably be adapted to England in the 19th century. Okay, wonderful. So that's why he, he decided after ordination that he would found the oratory here, obviously under the direction and, um, uh, and a patronage of the Pope of the time, who was um, Blessed Pius IX. And so Pius IX gave um, Father Newman his blessing. And also, uh, as a special mark of his regard and, and a bond of unity between Catholic England and Rome of, um, of the Popes, he also gave um, Father Newman a special present uh, which is the, 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 the entire body of one of the martyrs from the catacombs. And that body rests in our church to this day. So I'll show you that. Yeah, and who is this? Saint Valentine. Oh, fantastic. Not the same one as is famous for February the 14th. Yes. As in fact, a, a, a Roman martyr nonetheless. It's uh, not, not an entirely uncommon Roman name, actually, Valentinus, um, but somebody who was buried in the catacombs, known to be a martyr because of the way in which he was buried. Um, and so the Pope, at the time, many um, works of excavation were being carried out in Rome, especially of early Christian mm -hmm. uh, life and, and of, of the, um, the, the church in, in Rome in the, the, the first millennium, a time that was particularly dear to the Cardinal. Father Newman, as, as obviously he was in the early days, was always very interested in the church of the first um, thousand years, especially the first 500 years. Church of the Fathers, as we call it. And so the whole of the, the development of the Christian faith during those first 500 years or so was something that had formed him very profoundly. And he was, in fact, a, among his many other writings, going to um, produce um, in the 1850s um, a novel. He wrote two novels in addition to all his many other theological works. One was about, effectively, about his conversion. Yeah. With, with pseudonyms, of course. The, the other one, interesting enough, is about the early church. Um, it, it's about the, the, the life of the church in, in Christian North Africa in the third century, and, and centered around the figure of uh, Saint uh, Cyprian, the great bishop and martyr of the North African church. But because of the connection between the early church and the martyrs of, of that period, um, it, it was a special joy to him to have a relic, such an important, a complete relic, a whole body 
of one of the martyrs of the early church. Yeah. So marking for him this special kind of bond with Rome, especially yes, of Rome yes. of the early, the early centuries. Yeah. Father, as soon as I entered here, I was really struck by the design of this church. It's absolutely fascinating. And I'm guessing or I'm thinking that this was the thought of Newman. Yes, indeed. It is, as you say, magnificent. And perhaps unusually in many ways for an English Catholic church of the, of, of the era, Newman chose to have a church that was not in the Gothic style but something that, that represented the earlier centuries of the church. Rather like having the relic of the martyr from the Roman catacombs, he wanted the architecture of his church to reflect the early uh, life of the, the church. So although this church was not built until after his death, it was definitely built in accordance with his preferred um, ideas. The original church was, was a temporary one that, that the Cardinal put up with shortage of money, of course, he, he knew that there would have to be a permanent church later when there were funds available. It was only after he, of course, after he had died and become very famous that the fathers here decided the opportunity had come to, to raise money for a, a more magnificent and permanent church. And that's why this church was then designed especially to fulfill those ideas of the Cardinal Newman. So it does show the style of the early centuries of the church's history. So the, the nave um, with, the, with the columns and, uh, the, uh, and, the, and the long um, beam is very much modelled on some of the early Roman basilicas. And coming to the, the sanctuary, you see again the, the apse with, with a mosaic. That's again a common feature of many Roman churches. At a, at a mosaic over the, the apse that, that, that um, surmounts the altar as well. In this case, of course, the, um, the apse in a special way um, commemorates um, the cardinal. First of all, his choice of the, the dedication of the church was to be to our Blessed Lady. On either side, supporting the two figures of St. John the, the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. Mm. Uh, so, of course, two Saints John, who are patrons, of course, of John Henry Newman. So here we are, Father. This is the shrine of St. John Henry Newman. And I believe here is the motto for his coat of arms. That's correct, yes. He chose that um, specifically for when he was made a cardinal because it represents to him his whole approach to the spiritual, personal influence. When he was a teacher, first of all, in, in Oxford, and then, of course, obviously, later on in life as well, in Dublin and then here in Birmingham, he always sought not only to, to, to guide the intellect, mm. but also the heart. And of course, this is, uh, this is here he is himself, that's him. That's right, and the, that was a portrait that was painted by um, Sir John Millet, who was a famous artist of the day, um, and that uh, obviously to commemorate his being made a cardinal in 1879. So now, of course, it, it has pride of place here in the shrine, but um, originally this particular chapel, which is his shrine, as you rightly say, used to be the chapel of St. Philip, who was, okay. of course, the, 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 the founding father of the, the Neri, Roman yes. oratory and of the whole of the oratorian movement. And um, so there was a pic picture of St. Philip there originally. Certainly when I first came here, long before the the beatification even, um, over 30 years ago, it was the chapel of St. Philip. And as in Cardinal Newman's day, so also to this day, um, as well as being a chapel dedicated first to St. Philip and now to, to, to St. John Henry, it's also the place where 
the Oratorian community here meet daily for prayers. So right from the time of the Cardinal himself, when this house was first built in the early 1850s, this place was used and is still used for daily prayer. Oh, so this is the room of St. John Henry Newman. It is indeed. And, and as I say, just one room. Oratorian fathers don't have suites of rooms. Okay. So um, we live, in fact, fairly straightforward and, and I wouldn't say an austere life. It's not particularly austere in that sense. But we do con confine ourselves to a single room. And the Cardinal was no exception. So this room, as you see around you, is, it untouched? is where he lived. It's pretty well untouched. Ah. Um, it's still the same wallpaper as it was in his day. The bookshelves are still the same as they were. The fireplace is unchanged. And even, of course, the absence of any lighting, as we would understand it. There's no electricity, there's no gas in the room. Okay, and this is his study? This is his study. This is where he sat. There are photographs of him writing here at the desk. And he had just candlelight. Most, most of his, um, his, his life, just at the very end of his life, there was this, this paraffin lamp. But otherwise, mostly throughout his life, he only Just used a candle? candle? Just candle. Wow. Yeah. And that's, of course, somebody who's born at the beginning of the 19th century would be used to that. Of course. And I see over there a rosary. Yes, that's right. Let's go and have a look, because uh, it's, it's actually quite interesting to see the way in which the room was, you know, kind of arranged. So that um, this, as I say, he would live here. The, 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 over the side of that, that um, partition was the bedroom. Yes. In the mornings, he'd come out, and this is his predia. So he would kneel here, and there are the rosary that, that, that he used, various devotional pictures and books that he would use. His breviary is over there as well, so you'd have them all close to hand. And a picture of, of St. John the Evangelist, of course, his, his patron saint. So, Sancta Ioannis Ora Pronobis. So, St. John the Evangelist. And, and what's on the other side of this then? Well, on the other side is something very special which I want to show you now. So, you follow me I'm around. I'm excited, Father. I'm yes. excited. Yes. So, as I say, the Oratorians always have one room, and this was originally his bedroom. But when he became a cardinal mm -hmm. in 1879, having lived in this room since 1852, so for you know tw over 25 years, he then changed this part into his chapel. So, as a cardinal. It was kind of protocol for a cardinal to have a private chapel. Here's his cardinal's hat, the one officially presented to him when he was made a cardinal in 1879. So, here is the library. Wow, it's striking, isn't it? It certainly is. It's a, it's a, magnificent, um, it's a magnificent room, one of the great rooms of the house, of course, needless to say. Um, and it's, it's absolutely full of, of books, as you can see. Not all of them belong to the Cardinal, some of them are later. So um, he, he would have done a lot of his research, a lot of his study in here? Yes, quite a lot, because in fact, um, the whole of this section here on this, this side wall, Yes. Um, on, on this sort of ground floor level. All of that are what we call the, the folios of the Church Fathers. So it was the, the reading of the Church Fathers in the 1830s and 40s which brought uh, young Newman to a realization that he had to join the Catholic Church because that was the church to which these fathers belonged. Okay, so these books are responsible for uh, the young Newman's conversion. They are. They are, indeed. You can say that in, in, with no exaggeration, that these are the books which actually helped him to become a Catholic. So, Father, this is the museum which is open to the public. That's correct, yes. Fantastic. How about this? The very first letter that he wrote home in 1808, 
He was only seven years old. Look at the wonderful handwriting. Great, beautiful handwriting. So Father, here we are. We've come to the end of my visit here, my day here. And certainly one thing that has struck me and that I've learned is that yes, Newman was certainly an intellectual, he was certainly a thinker, but he was a man of great heart and a man of great love. So I just want to thank you for your time and for such a warm welcome. And I look forward to visiting you again. Thank you, Father Guy. Thank you, Neil, for coming. The thing that has struck me the most today is this coat of arms behind me, the motto of the coat of arms, cor ad cor locator, which means heart speaks to heart. And this is the personal relationship that can be achieved through man and God through and prayer. So when I allow silence in my life, when I sit before the blessed sacraments, I can access the mystery of God. I can access the heart of God in silence where heart speaks to heart. Do you allow silence in your life? Do you allow the opportunity for Jesus to pierce your own heart so that your heart can meet the heart of God? God wants to bring your heart to greater freedom, but he will not force his love on you. No, not at all. It's up to you to open the door of your heart and invite him in. Thank you so much for joining me on today's pilgrimage. My name is Neil McDonough, and from everyone here at Shalom World, God bless you all. Thank you.